Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniel. I'm a software engineer at Intel, and we are going to talk about user space in Cepher. Uh, this is the, uh, the topic of the, of the day. We'll, I'll give a very brief and simplified overview of uh, user space in Cepher, uh, and then I'll talk about uh, how you're going to share data using uh, user threads, and uh, we'll, we'll go into uh, some brief details on syscalls, on how, basically how, 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 you, how you use uh, uh, kernel services from, from user space, and then we'll go, go to talk about uh, why and why not to use user space, and we'll end with uh, some Q&A sessions. Well, for user space, the, the idea is kind of simple in a sense. You have kernel mode and user mode, where the, uh, in kernel mode, you have uh, elevate privileges, basically you, you, you have access to everything, like uh, all the hardware devices and, and all that. And user space, have uh, the, the user mode, in user mode you have limited uh, access, uh, basically have a very limited uh, uh, capability to, to, to make sure they, they cannot uh, do bad things in a sense. So uh, kernel mode sometimes also refer to supervisor or privilege mode. And user mode is um, kind of unprivileged mode, uh, but I, uh, usually people, uh, the hardware vendors usually just call them user mode at that, at that point. Uh, user threat ones is user mode, uh, kernel threats one in kernel mode, and uh, most of the, uh, the subsystems uh, runs in kernel mode, uh, uh, device driver, when, when you're coding the device driver API, uh, they need to be in kernel mode most of the time because you, you need to access the hardware, like have a register and stuff. And of course, the, kernel, the core kernel has to run in kernel mode, like the scheduler or um, that kind of thing. So, And when, when, when I say this kind of thing, the concept is simple. It's, it's because really it's this. What you are limiting in user mode is basically limiting uh, the, uh, the user threads from accessing certain memory. Well, not exactly the like, memory in, in terms of like, SRAM or, or, or like a memory map flash. It's just limiting the access to memory addresses, which means like MMIO, uh, hardware register space, uh, you can have a memory map flash uh, area, that kind of thing. So uh, for that, like, uh, like I said, Kernel, in kernel mode, kernel threads have access to all of this. Uh, that's, that's just the user space model in, in Cepher. For, uh, for user threat, uh, it's like uh, you basically grant user threads access to certain memories, certain, certain me uh, memory regions. For example, the, the, uh, the left two can access the, the, the memory region of the left two and the right two and the, can access the right two. Uh, and when the left uh, user, uh, two user first try to access the, uh, the right two memory region, the hardware blocks the access to it. So, you, uh, so well, at least for, for the current model, if you try to access it, it will create a uh, fault, a page fault mostly, and then the user thread will be uh, terminated. And because of because of the you, you, because of the user that doesn't have access to everything, and by default, actually, the, by default, it has no access to uh, most of the memory. It, uh, it has basically only uh, have access to uh, like the text region because you have to execute code and the uh, read-only data region, and also its own th uh, thread stack. So, how do you share data between user threads? So, for example, we have something like this. You have, a, uh, say, three groups of threads and four groups of data. They are logically partitioned, for example. Uh, you have a bunch of data that's like coming from a sensor, from, from, from one sensor and uh, another set of uh, data coming from another sensor. And then you have uh, a group of threads processing the, the data from, from, bo from both set of data. For, so. Uh, it is the, the, the process of sharing is uh, uh, is mostly at build time. Uh, you can do it at one time too. But well, uh, the the first step is that you assign uh, data to memory partitions. So basically, group 
Like for example, the, the memory partition A has that four piece of data, uh, memory partition B, C, and D, and so forth. And then you create a memory partition with reference to those uh, memory domains. You create memory domains with reference to those memory partitions. But at this point, the memory domains are not complete. And you actually have to assign threads to the memory domain for them to be complete because uh, memory domain with no, th no threads, uh, it's like, there's, there's no purpose because the, those, uh, the threads are running uh, within like the, the concept of memory domain so that, every, uh, so that everything in that domain can be shared. Uh, and this is kind of, and this, will, this is kind of the, uh, uh, the relationship between memory domain and memory partitions, basically. Uh, so here, uh, you can see that the, uh, for memory partition A, the, uh, the threads from memory domain one and two can, uh, can read and write the data in memory partition A, and then for memory partition B, only memory domain two can access to it, can access those, uh, and so forth for C and D. Uh, you can see the arrows, like, because uh, here it's like, when we create the domain, the memory domain, we have we, we, we use the we, we assign the partition, the memory partition to those domains. So in a sense, here so we, we have this. And uh, it's it's uh, it's kind of like a very simplified way of describing memory domain and uh, partition, but the actual setting them up uh, uh, requires a lot of like a linker magic in a sense. So uh, please refer to the, uh, <laughs> the, the online documentation for, uh, for the examples on how to, how to actually do that, do this in, in the code. Uh, and one thing to remember, global variables cannot be accessed by any of the user threads. They have to be uh, in a memory domain. So if you just declare uh, but in, uh, in, in a C file, you, uh, the, no user threads can access to it, can access it. Uh, this, is, this, this, is, this, is how, this is how you uh, share data between user threads. Uh, the next topic is uh, uh, this course. Um, the main purpose of this call is for user thread to access uh, uh, kernel services. For example, uh, you want to lock a mutex, uh, unlock mutex, take, take a give a, a semaphore, uh, uh, send something to the mailbox, the kind of things, and uh, and also like uh, when you want to access devices, like uh, uh, you want to do I squared C transaction or send something to the UART. And in, in, in the server model, we call them uh, kernel objects. Here are some common kernel objects that we that, that, that there's in separate, like for example, uh, mailbox, memory slab, mutexes, the kind of things. But for device driver, remember that the, each kernel object is not the device driver themselves, but each de device driver instance. So, for example, if you have uh, say three I squared C controllers on the hardware and they are enabled, you have three instances of the of the I squared C controller, and you have three. I swear see kernel objects. And similar to uh, memory access, like similar to, to, to what uh, the memory access model, uh, user threads has very limited, uh, you can restrict uh, access from user thread uh, to, to, to each object. In, actually in a sense, in, the, in, uh, in actual usage, you actually grant access to each kernel object to each, to, to each user thread. So the model is uh, for kernel thread, you have, uh, they have access to all kind of objects. But for user threads, uh, you have to explicitly grant access from, uh, for, uh, of a kernel object to that thread. So, you, uh, so for example, you have two mutex, you define two mutex and then you assign them to two threads. Uh, in, like individual to two threads, and each thread cannot access the other mutexes. So that's this this basically the, the model for for, for 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 the for the kernel objects and the, and the syscall is 
in a sense, uh, in practice, one time is not cheap, for example. Uh, it's like, uh, it's, it, it, it's highlighted. this is a basically full chart of, of, the, of the Cisco, uh, how, how Cisco is being done. Uh, if you're in already in kernel mode, like you're in kernel thread, it's easy. Uh, you just go straight to the implementation. Uh, just, just one indirect call to, to, uh, to the implementation. Uh, in addition to uh, uh, this, this part, uh, in this, uh, in addition to running it in the the, uh, the kernel thread, uh, this path is also taken when uh, when you are in uh, interrupt. So uh, while you are in the uh, in ISR, uh, this is also the path that's being taken when you when you do a syscall. Uh, so uh, for example, uh, don't. Don't do mutexes. Uh, don't don't lock or unlock mutexes in, in, in ISL because uh, uh, you may deadlock deadlock the system. <laughs> um, and then for the user mode, this is this is the <laughs> this is actually a simplified kind of a simplified flow chart. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I leave out a lot of uh, the, the core function, but the basic idea is that uh, uh, you have to. Uh, Go into kernel mode to, ex to, to basically execute the, the, the implementation. So uh, the first step, uh, like if you're in kernel mode, the first step is to uh, package the function argument, and then you, it goes through the previous ex escalation to, for, to go from user mode to kernel mode. So the uh, so you can use a different set of permission, like a, a different set of uh, page table for MMU and different set of uh, memory region permission for for MPU, for example. Uh, and then after previous uh, previous escalation, you're in kernel mode, and then uh, you have to unpackage all the all the all the agreement, all the all the function arguments into uh, basically just the the elements. So, for uh, if you have a, if you pass a sixty bit a sixty four bit data with a, uh, on a thirty two bit system, you have to uh, uh, the the background has to uh, unravel this. It's like pack it in a certain way, and then unpack it unpack the the, the data. So after unpacking the data, it has to go through a verification uh, to make sure that the data being passed are valid. For, uh, like, uh, for example, if you pass a, try to pass a mutex, uh, this verification has to verify that this is a mutex. You cannot just pass in any uh, arbitrary uh, memory address and call it a mutex. No, no that, that's not a good thing because you, you would be uh, modifying arbitrary memory uh, in kernel mode, which, has, which basically has to have access to everything. Uh, so this verification must be done. And another part of this, like if you are passing something, uh, you're passing a memory buffer or a string, for example, uh, this, in, in this stage, you need to copy, you need to copy that, uh, basically uh, allocate a memory in kernel mode and copy, copy the memory buffer or the string into then we allocate a buffer. This is mostly to prevent um, uh, something modifying the buffer what, uh, between, between the syscall and the actual implementation is being done. It's, it's kind of a, it's a security measure too, because uh, with a preemptive thread, uh, the, it, the, the, the threat going through this can uh, can be preempted, and then some some things can come in and modify the buffer, and then the and then the original file comes back in, run with the modified data. You you, you don't want to do that because the uh, the data can be uh, modified in a malicious way. For example, like uh, Bluetooth, you can you can uh, massage the the, uh, the package in a sense to uh, do something bad. And uh, I don't have the return path. For this, for this, but the, the return path is very similar to the uh, uh, to, to, to path here. It's, it's just the, the in, in reverse. So you package the return value, uh, go 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 through the uh, previous de-escalation process to go back to user mode, and then uh, unpackage the the, the argument uh, in a way so that the uh, the site of calling this function. Uh, Act like it's just another function call. So this call is kind of hidden. Uh, 
like behind the scene things for, 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 the, for the caller. So, um, after seeing this little chart, someone might uh, ask why, why do we need uh, user space? Uh, there's always a, the big question is why do I care? Uh, one very, very <laughs> first things on why or why not using user space, or basically why not using user space, uh, the hardware must support MMU or MPU, uh, memory management unit or memory protection unit, or in the risc 5 world is called physical memory protection, if I remember correctly. Uh, if you have no MMU or MPU, there's, the, 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 you cannot use uh, user space because you don't have hardware to uh, guard the access to, to the memory. And another thing, like with this, with the, uh, if this is called flow chart, you can see like uh, the latencies goes way up for user for user threat. Like uh, not not just only this call, but for contact switching too. Even even if you're switching between uh, uh, user threats, you, uh, you have to uh, change the page table, f uh, or you need to reprogram your uh, MPU for. So, so to, for, for, for the permission of that of the new the incoming threat. And another downside of using user space is that uh, the memory usage requirements uh, goes up because uh, if you are using MMU, you need to uh, store the page table somewhere so you can swap uh, in and out doing uh, uh, context switching. And then. Uh, for user threat, there's an additional stack uh, that is needed for, for user threat because uh, when you're going into kernel mode, the, uh, the execution is no longer using the, 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 the user threat stack. It's, it, goes, it uses the previous stack to, uh, in a sense, to avoid, kind of avoid leaking uh, data through the stack. Uh, and uh, the, at least the current implementation uh, of what the MMU code is that the previous stack uh, is set up in a way uh, so the users, user, users that cannot access to them. They uh, kind of like a, a, a kernel, it's, it's kind of like kernel, only, only, uh, only things in the kernel mode can access the previous stack. And also one thing to consider is the, uh, the page alignment for memory partition because uh, the access granularity is uh, on the for MMU is uh, on the page size. It's like uh, most is 4K, but for MPU, you, uh, it might be. Uh, it it, it based, it's based on the MPU. For example, if you have a, a, two, a power of two requirement, so you always have to pad the, uh, the the memory partition region to to the power of two. So if you have, uh, say for example, four byte data and, and the alignment need to be uh, 8K, then you're almost wa wasting 8K uh, of memory for that. And uh, and in, in addition to, to this, uh, when considering uh, whether to use uh, user space, uh, you have to understand the threat model that the user space uh, implementation is based on. Very first thing is that there's no interactive user. Uh, I don't know why you want to have interactive user on an embedded system, but that's, that's the model. No interactive user, uh, no login. <laughs> and another thing is that uh, uh, the, the, the threat model is that we are not guarding against malicious code. Uh, although the threat model says that uh, we don't trust the code running in, use, uh, in user mode, however, uh, because you have to package the whole firmware together. Uh, so if you don't trust the code, why are you packaging it in the flash? <laughs> in the flash? So uh, that's the original model. That's the original model. However, with the, uh, with the link linkable, linkable module now, uh, things get a lot complicated because you can basically load whatever code in there. So uh, that, that, that's the next talk. Kind of plugging in here, but that's the next talk. Uh, and another thing about how the the threat model is that it's like like I said, not guarding again. Man, this is called most most of the time it's just uh, kind of just preventing uh, coding error. For example, uh, 
instead, uh, well, I think uh, kind of like a, a, some of the common uh, error in terms of memory access that you uh, do some pointer math, you, you add a pointer and a size, and if it wraps around, then you, this is something that you want to catch and, and, and fix it in your code. So instead of, or instead of it, uh, trying to access invalid memory. And the, the other thing is that it, it just isolate between memory domains. So that uh, basically, uh, uh, so the bad behavior in a sense of uh, the threats in one domain will not affect the, uh, the, uh, the behavior of, of the threats in another domain as long as they don't share the same memory partition. Because if, uh, if they modify the same uh, data and then one group is writing bad data and then the other group reading bad data, then there's not much you can do there. So I think that's a very brief and simple overview. I hope you're all confused. <laughs> So not a, not a technical question, but rather uh, since uh, in our own applications we don't use user space, I'm just curious if you uh, could name a couple of real-world practical applications where this is, is being used. Real world, uh, something I cannot talk about it here. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, I don't know any commercial product that's using it, but that's mostly because of my ignorance. And one thing I, I just want to uh, mention is that uh, what we are providing is just a framework. So whether you want to use it is up to you based on your requirements, like what your product is doing. So um, I, I actually follow up for example to this. Like if you have a, a sensor package that you, you, you put it into a remote location, that you, that you just uh, go there and grab the data once a month or once a year, uh, the, uh, and they don't do any like uh, uh, data transmission or receiving anything. You may not need user space because you don't, uh, because you, you you're not uh, getting you, you you probably will not get malicious data that that compromise the operation of the of, of the whole thing. So, but this is so regular, yeah. Just just to answer this question. I think what, what Daniel mentioned with regard to loadable extensions, which is something new in Zephyr right now, but it is definitely something that has been done outside of Zephyr in the context of Zephyr. Right now we have something, but it's mostly, I mean, when, when you want to use an MPU or an MMU, it's about uh, guarding like a, a basic firmware from third party data that you might actually you know, you have in the system, you know, through, you know, you know, extensions, codecs, whatever. You want to allow ex uh, firmware extensibility, and that's where, that's like one guard. But also, the, 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 the practical solution, and that actually the, the basically was going to be my question, is all of the things that were listed on the slide, it's actually, there is a lot of things that we, in Zephyr, that we have right now where because of historical reasons and, and whatnot, I mean, we don't have much of error checking, for example, yeah, or parameter verification, etc. I mean, that has changed over, over the years, uh, but things that we couldn't put in the implementation that is used in the non-user space case are available in the, uh, in the verify function. If you go to the syscall, uh, uh, diagram, you see this verify. Yeah, depending depending on the function, uh, there is a lot of error checking happening there. Yeah, and if you are running a safety critical application or a, you know that, that's actually something you want. Uh, right now, however, and this is my question actually. Yeah, right now, however, is this is all depending on user space. Yeah, we really need to figure out a way how to start moving a lot of verification and, and, and checks that we have in this function that is enabled right now in user space into the main Im implementation. Uh, 
we did that in the past with the check if macro and stuff like that to avoid uh, explosion in the footprint usage. But we need to figure out a way, yeah, maybe we should have like a two level thing where the implementation and you can actually enable the, the, the verification function if, if needed to add more checks, yeah. So this is, uh, this is uh, a question and I, I briefly talked with Daniel about that. This is not so easy because with the design. My second question is what are the differences in the implementation uh, when you have an MBU versus MMU, yeah? The, dif the difference between MMU and MPU? Uh, mo well, uh, uh, at least most most of the things are common uh, between M uh, between MPU and MMU. So, uh, for isolation, uh, memory domain. Uh, we all have that. The uh, I can't think of any major thing except that uh, with MPU you might you 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 are limited with uh, you limited by the uh, the number of regions in the in the hardware. So you have to be very uh, careful on <laughs> how 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 you uh, structure your memory yeah. to yeah. minimize the, the the number of region. But otherwise. Uh, there's always, uh, that, that, that not always, that's uh, one issue about uh, whether you sh whether threads in the memory stack should act to be able to access the, 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 the thread stack of, of, of the other thread in, in the same domain. Uh, this, uh, if I remember correctly, the introduction of uh, that, that actually cut introduced into the, the into, uh, when, when we introduced memory domain so that every th every thread in memory domain can access the stack of other threads st stack in, in the same domain but uh, uh, but the, the thing is the arm the arm MPU implementation is uh, I think it's uh, it got implemented before the, all the memory domain things so it has uh, it has the uh, first stack isolation already uh, built in there, so there's some different some difference between the, uh, the, uh, the actual implementation. But otherwise, uh, at least for to, uh, in facing that the user facing part, the developer facing part, if you're writing an application, they should mostly act the same. Right. I was going to interject again, just riffing off on us, um, going back to the syscall chart which was all like like great and it, it, it shows all the things that need to happen. I think the marketing side of this though that I think got missed is that this is all invisible to app code. I mean one of the one of the things I think we have done best on this and this is all Andrew our dearly departed Andrew Bowie's work. Um, I mean he didn't die he's at Apple. Um, but um, 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 you know, for the most part, if you've got an app and you need to get, you know, some kind of, 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 of transaction into kernel code to pass an argument or whatever, you need to add a new syscall, you just declare it as a syscall, you write your validation function, and you're mostly done. And then if you've got data that you need to pass that's not arbitrary, then you might have other stuff to do. There's a function you need to call to copy the data out. If you need to add another kernel object, that's actually kind of a mess because you need to go and edit a Python uh, script right now. Um, but but really, I mean, it's it, the, all of the functions, the entirety of the Zephyr API for the most part is exactly the same mm -hmm. in user space. Now, I, again, performance-wise, that can be very different. But, but really, I mean, it's, I, I think we've got a much stronger story here than I think really any other you know, uh, uh, embedded OS, and, and, and frankly, even than like Linux does. You need to get into kernel space in Linux. It's hard, and you've got to, you've got lots of tools, right? You can choose like you know a SysFS node. You can open something in Proc. You can do all kinds of things. But you're looking at like okay, here's your six function calls that you've got to implement, and all the callbacks and all of that stuff. And in Zephyr, it's you, you just go and you you add one preprocessor token, and you're done. So uh, well, actually, yeah. extending to that is like uh, even 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 though uh, even uh, even if you declare a function in syscall. Uh, the, the, the like the line this says it's like uh, it's all behind the scene. So even if you uh, set config user space to no, uh, at least from the uh, API user perspective, they don't need to change anything. They just they can still call KMU text log. It will function the same. 
in their perspective. Thank you for this presentation. I just have a question. So if you um, access uh, something and another memory domain and you don't have the permission, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned that the thread will be terminated. Mm -hmm. This is the case on both MMU and MPU? Uh, yes, because it, 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 uh, it will, well, at least on the MMU uh, term, it will cause a uh, page fault, yeah. which goes through, uh, 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 I think it goes through C fatal error, and then you eventually call K thread abort. Uh, on the MMU, um, on the MPU side, the the, the hardware may call a different like uh, emission, like privilege access denied, that kind of thing. But the mechanism is still the same. The idea is still the same. It goes through C fatal error, and eventually you will call K thread abort. And the scheduler will just select another thread. It could be in another domain. Yeah. Uh, when when it when it returns from the from from the fault, it will. <laughs> you will select uh, if you if, if you are using the switch. You will try try to another switch. Uh, if you are not using the switch, uh, I'm not <laughs> I'm not familiar with that part of the code. But yeah. And I suppose if it was essential, it will just term, terminate the. It will just do a fatal error. It was marked as essential. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Just also another question. It would you consider a, a good practice to to put the whole code in, uh, in a module and use library app named instead of just creating the different partitions. I just put the, the whole memory domain in a, in, like a, in a library instead of just creating each memory domain uh, manually with the different partitions. Oh. There's, a, there's an API that the app has to make call to basically do this and based on this stuff would just declare on this variable domain in some particular domain. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have any tooling or anything that helps, you know, visualize to some degree simply like just the, the memory partitioning layout for, you know, for someone who's trying to set this up? Um, and so whether it's things like the alignment restrictions and saying, hey, maybe if you, you know, read ordered these, you'd, you'd be, you know, be better off and not waste as much space or anything of that nature? Oh. No, we don't. Okay. This one. <laughs> well, but we, well, we have something like this to to to, to memorize the the, uh, the placement in the link of suite. But that but that part doesn't depend on user space. We 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 have oh, I don't remember it was done a couple of years ago. Uh, as a developer of a driver for a peripheral that is really custom and doesn't use a standard API. How difficult it is to expose my code in user space? Do I need to worry about all the um, uh, marshalling of the arguments, or will this be transparent, like for uh, uh, system, the other system calls? The wait, uh, you don't have to worry about the the marsh like uh, the 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 left three and the and, and the marshal, and you don't have to worry about it. It's, it's done behind the scene. Uh, you, what you need to implement is the verification function and the implementation, and declare the uh, your API as a syscall. Um, I have a question. So um, there is a set of related uh, technologies like this trusted firmware RAM and trusted execution environment. So if I were to explain to our customers and users when do you use a user space and when do you package your, you know, custom code in, in the trusted execution environment? Would you have any advice or this is just something you, you're not familiar with? Um. <laughs> to be honest, I, I'm, not, I'm not very uh, familiar with all the, all the, all the, 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 the trust zone and that kind of thing. So I, I refrain from commenting. <laughs> Uh, oh, yeah, here's another question. Yeah, just a quick question. You, asked, you said in your, in, your, in your slide that there is no users in uh, Zephyr. Mm -hmm. do, you know, do you know if the, in, the, in the future there will be? Or oh, it's not planned at all? Uh, personally, I don't, I, I, I don't see this use case for having a user on the embedded system. But well, I can tell you, if you set a product, maybe you, can, you want some of your your customers have some engineers, so they want to access the product and 
do some stuff. But then if your product is doing something bad and you want to send another people like maintainers, they want to have access to other, other features. So the engineer will log in as an engineer and we do some stuff, basic stuff, is know how. And then you see if you want to send a maintainer, he will log in as a maintainer and can access more features and can do more stuff. That's something that we may need. <laughs> Uh, I don't know, if, uh, uh, but like as a personality, I think you're stepping into the, the Linux territory. Like uh, as a, uh. yeah, I mean, but to his point, I mean, there there are MCU platforms that are, you know, considered crossovers, and and as such, they're fairly powerful. And you could, I can imagine, vision something like that, or having a display with the user input to it, and you want to kind of partition that off in a way that it's not going to, you know, someone's sitting there screwing around with it, trying to see how they can break it, right? And it's on a critical system behind it. Whoa. But the, I think one of the keys here is if you if you determine that you have a uh, a, a product requirement for it, then then this is here. It's transparent to the application, uh, and the only cost is the overhead of the marshalling, the, the escalation, all that, that path right there. And if that's acceptable for your application, then that's what you're going to do. Because yeah, well, if it has that requirement. Well, I'm just thinking out loud here. Well, you will have to implement, like, for example, uh, maybe as a server, you would port it over to separate something, something like that, or, or, or login terminal, that kind of thing. So. Um, the user space framework doesn't prevent you from uh, from having users in the system. It's just that the, the threat model, when what is what is the threat model that the user space uh, implementation is based on, does not. <laughs> uh, what was a good word for this? It's like it. It's just not the threat model. It's just it doesn't. It it, it it's. It doesn't have that use case in, in okay. the threat model, and we don't really uh, cook for that at this point. So if you have something uh, that the user space is not uh, it's not adequate for for use use case, uh, feel, feel free to uh, create an issue and uh, post it on on the mailing list or this call so we can talk about it. Mm -hmm. I, th I, th I think there's an issue already, just to mention. But I actually, it would it would be wrong to say that Zephyr does not support users, right? We have we have one single user. We actually have shell, and you can we have like a, uh, recently you can do all kind of crazy stuff with the shell that almost looks like you know you are logged in in a Linux system sometimes, yeah. Uh, but uh, my question is, I mean, this is like just this this is called. Uh, uh, slide is actually very, uh, as you said, it's simplified. A lot mm -hmm. of things uh, is happening behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. So when we build Zephyr, everything builds, etc. Obviously, we know a lot. Of, there's a lot of complaints about the multi-stage build, but we do that not only for user space. We do it for so many other things as well. But uh, I mean. Is that I mean? Is that a lot of overhead when 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 you enable user space and and what actually goes behind the scenes? Is that I mean how complex it is to get the things right uh, uh, to operate in this in this manner and using this workflow? Well, well, I'm I'm very biased in this, in this instance, so. Uh, I would say that it's not exactly easy, but it's not that hard because the the, the things you need to implement is the uh, the verification function to make sure that everything uh, the the function arguments are valid before you you send it to the implementation. And we have uh, uh, examples a lot. Uh, I, not exactly a lot, but we have example on, in the documentation and. We actually have a lot of implementation or verification in, in the code itself, so they can serve as a, a learning material, in a sense. Uh, otherwise, as a, as a developer, most things are intermediate 
difficulty uh, uh, for the build system is is, is there. Uh, it may take a while. <laughs> well, in, in terms of building, uh, it might take a, it might take longer because it's past the file, pass all the file, look for the syscall, and then generate all the uh, the, the, the behind the scene functions. So it's not free. All right. Uh, yeah, we're actually at time, uh, but let's give a round of applause for Daniel. Thank you so much. Thank you.